On August 24, 2000, at the Nintendo Space World 2000, fans of the company sure had a lot to be excited about. At the event, Nintendo revealed not only the long-awaited follow-up to the Game Boy, the Game Boy Advance, but debuted their next home console, the GameCube. Most notably, the audience was treated to two games that would never exist, but survive on in the imagination of the internet for long after. Super Mario 128 and a gritty cutscene for a Zelda game. Tucked away in all the excitement was a strange mansion populated by ghosts for a game helmed by a green afterthought, Luigi. That title, Luigi's Mansion, would beat nearly all other GameCube games teased at Space World 2000 to the punch. Launching on September 14, 2001 in Japan and two months later in North America. For a time, Luigi's AAA debut could not escape the shadow of his big brother. Many complained about or were simply disappointed by the lack of a Super Mario game to mark the new system's landing. Luigi's Mansion was quickly derided as formulaic, incohesive, dull, and the worst sin a game in 2001 could commit. Short. I was there. I had a Nintendo GameCube, and I'm sad to admit, I was convinced. I owned or played nearly every one of the 35 Nintendo GameCube games to crack 1 million sales, but Luigi's Mansion sat dormant on the shelf of my local Walmart. I never picked it up. I believed the critics, and why wouldn't I? Luigi's Mansion was a potent symbol of failure. In a special episode celebrating the Super Mario series, X plays as Adam Sessler, channeling his inner angry video game nerd, described Luigi's Mansion as the most egregious abortion ever spawned for the Mushroom Kingdom. Real classy, Adam. He argues that heading up the console with a Luigi's Mansion game would be like going to a Rolling Stones concert only to find Rascal Flatts as filling in. Dated references. Radical. While I'm singling out X-Play here, at that point their opinion was mostly riding the coattails of popular consensus. Yet, when we peel back the thick coating of hate the game received for not being Super Mario 64 Part 2, what do we have left? A surprisingly fascinating game worth spending, oh geez, look at that progress bar, two hours talking about. In part one, we're going to set Luigi and his haunted home aside for a minute and explore the history of Mario, because we can't really understand Luigi without first reckoning with his more popular, successful, and talented brother, who is, in effect, video games is most iconic player one. In Who You Gonna Call, I will discuss how the legacy of blockbuster films and games, particularly the comedy classic Ghostbusters, helped usher in the franchise-centric media model still in vogue today, and how that influenced the design of Luigi's Mansion. In part three, I want to look at an entirely different influence on Luigi's Mansion's design, Resident Evil, and ask, is Luigi's Haunted Ride a survival horror game? The answer may shock you. Next, in a bout of YouTube pettiness, I will take on a channel 3,200 times bigger than mine, The Game Theorists, who have made quite a few videos about our green plumber friend. And in my way too thorough discussion of their entertaining theories, ask what value we can find in them. Hint, I don't find it. Finally, in part five, rounding out not just this video, but the entirety of season one of Elaborate Reviews, I will argue that Luigi is player two, personified, which, as you'll see, is the most beautiful compliment I could give him. I'm taking a semi-big risk, putting by far the most important section last, so please stick around for it. Before we get on with the show though, I am remiss to note that insightful 20,000 plus word 2 hour reviews do not fall out of trees, at least not where I'm from. If you enjoy my videos and want to see more of them, please consider becoming a patron of the channel. 
beyond just helping me out, you'll get special Patreon-only videos. I'll put your name in the credits and even say it out loud sometimes. You'll also gain a unique role on our Discord server. A special thank you to all of you already supporting the production of these elaborate reviews. It's enough to make a girl cry. Now, let's get on with the show because Mario is missing. Luigi's Mansion is not the first video games Luigi starred in without his big brother. That honor goes to 1993's aptly titled Mario is Missing. The Super Nintendo game is not a high-flying platformer, sports sim, inventive RPG, wacky racer, or puzzle game. It's an educational romp not too dissimilar from Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego? Incidentally, finding Miss San Diego was a favorite pastime of mine in the computer lab growing up. Mario is Missing may accomplish its goal of educating children about the world, though I wouldn't know, I've never learned geography from it, but it certainly doesn't accomplish the goal of being a good Mario game. Heck, its title implies our leading man isn't even here. Mario is Missing then is interesting precisely because of what's left out. It's a Mario game without Mario, and without him, it also lacks pretty much any personality or flavor, and it doesn't help that Nintendo had barely anything to do with it. It's quite fitting that Luigi's first starring role is for a nothing burger of a game where not only is his name not in the title, but his much more famous brothers is. It's not like Mario hadn't had his name on games before. By the time Mario is Missing released, his name had graced over 20. By the time Luigi's Mansion, the first game with Luigi's Mansion in the title dropped, that number had ballooned to over 50. As an aside, I know the games are Super Mario Bros, with the plural brothers implying Luigi's existence, but imagine if you made a video game about the first flight, and instead of highlighting the Wright brothers, you called them the Wilbur boys. It doesn't make any sense. Despite the eight years, completely different developers, an entire console generation, and dozens of games between Mario's Missing and Luigi's Mansion, the inciting incident of both is exactly the same. Mario is missing. It's up to Luigi to save him, not just out of brotherly love, but because Mario is the world's player one. And who knows what we'd do without him. This elaborate review is about Luigi's Mansion, and more generally about Luigi, but we can't understand who Luigi is apart from his famous brother. Luigi, not Wario, is Mario's shadow, Mario's doppelganger. He is not the opposite of Mario, but a reaction to him. Mario is the sun whose light reflects Luigi's dark moon. We wouldn't be able to see or understand the green man without him. So, this section is a brief history of Mario, how Luigi works his way into Mario's universe, and most importantly, how Mario invents represents and perpetuates the concept of player one. Once we understand who Mario is and why he matters for our discussion of Luigi, we will put a pause on this idea and continue on with the next few chapters, where we will discuss in depth Luigi's Mansion's influences and design. In the last part of this video, and Elaborate Reviews Season 1, we will return to this concept, though instead of discussing how Mario is the ideal player one, we will show how Luigi symbolizes the concept of player two and why that matters. Mario had humble beginnings. He got his start video gaming in Donkey Kong, where he lacked a name, let alone one on the arcade cabinet. His journey may have stopped there if not for Miyamoto's dream of an everyman character who would appear in every video game he ever made, and his decision to ditch the name Mr. Video. I mean, seriously, imagine if Mario was Mr. Video. That'd be awful. Miyamoto's next game starring Mario would be where we both get Mario's classic profession and the first appearance of Luigi, Mario Bros. 
In the simple arcade game, players control Mario, now a plumber, as he clears the sewers of monsters. Unlike Donkey Kong, and as its plural name implies, Mario Bros can be a multiplayer experience, in which case the second player takes control of Luigi. Luigi at this early stage is purely meant as a stand-in for Mario. Not only is he just a color palette swap of Mario, but his name is meant to be similar to Ruigi, a Japanese word meaning similar as in similar to Mario. Mario may have already been popular, but he got his big break and was propelled to international stardom with the release of Super Mario Bros. The history is already quite established, but it bears repeating. Super Mario Bros. is a massively important video game. Depending on who you ask, you might hear that it's one of the greatest games of all time, the game which made Miyamoto Miyamoto, one of the best-selling video games, single-handedly saved the video game industry from the brink of annihilation, or simply the most important video game ever. While we can objectively discuss its monstrous sales numbers and how it launched the best-selling video game franchise, the rest of these claims are difficult to assess. Sure, video gaming as we know it would probably look different in a world without Super Mario Bros. But would the industry have truly keeled over and just never existed? Would Miyamoto, who developed The Legend of Zelda at the same time as Super Mario Bros, not be considered a great developer without it? I guess I'm just not interested in trying to answer these questions. But what I am interested in evaluating is Super Mario Bros's broader impact on how we view video games. The real impact of Super Mario Bros is that for a time to almost everyone, especially lay people, Super Mario Bros was not just a video game, it was the video game. You know how for like 20 years nearly all moms called all video game consoles Nintendos? Well, in a sense, we could say that a lot of games were Mario's too. While Super Mario Bros. was not the first platformer, the thousands of clones that followed it, hoping to grab just a fraction of its success, point to its influence over what kinds of games people made in its wake. Id Software, who would eventually make Doom, cut their industrial teeth first with Commander Keen, a Mario Bros.-like. Sonic, Sega's flagship character, was not only inspired by Mario, but meant to do what Nintendo don't, or do more than Mario. Across the late 80s, nearly every game developer felt the need to produce at least a few side-scrolling platforming games inspired by Mario in one way or another, and this narrowing of the field helped redefine video games in Mario's image. I'm not trying to over-validate the perspective of people who don't play games. Of course, Mario wasn't literally the center of the video gaming universe, and anyone who played video games knew this. But when people tried to understand and explain what a video game was, Super Mario Bros, and by extension, Mario himself, were the images which came to mind. Popularity has consequences. What Van Helsing is to Vampire Hunter, what Sherlock Holmes is to Detective, what Superman is to Superhero, Mario is to video game character, and more importantly for our discussion, the concept of player one. If Mario is the stick against which all other video game characters, particularly Luigi, are measured, it's worth looking at Mario's inherent qualities to discover what a video game character even is. Mario himself is a response to a precursor, the first or maybe zeroth definitive video game character, Pac-Man. Donkey Kong was an attempt by Nintendo to capitalize and emulate the popularity of Pac-Man, and Super Mario Bros. is a kind of spiritual successor to Pac-Land. Pac-Man and Super Mario Bros. do not just share dovetailed histories, but similar dispositions. Both feature leading male characters who would come to represent games as a whole. Pac-Man, a wholly unique character, a yellow ball who must consume, is instantly recognizable, and for a time was the face of video games. But what personality do we get from Pac-Man and his game? Well, first of all, Pac-Man is happy-go-lucky, despite the precarity of his arcade life. 
In nearly every promotional image of the character, he's got a smile which fills up half his face. Pac-Man is simple. Pac-Man likes to move, and constantly, he literally won't stop moving until he reaches a wall. Pac-Man is an inherent underdog, as he is chased by foes who outnumber him and kill him on touch. We love to root for him because he doesn't speak, and rather is a man of action, one who faces adversity with a smile on his face. Pac-Man communicates to the player that they should focus not on winning, not even necessarily on high scores, but on play, on having a good time, on relaxation and fun. Mario, unlike Sonic or most future video game mascots who try to be everything their predecessor is not, is a fulfillment of Pac-Man's qualities rather than a refutation of them. Mario is happy-go-lucky, always smiling despite the insane lengths he goes to protect the Mushroom Kingdom. Mario is a man of few words. You're lucky if you get a wahoo most of the time. Mario is simple. His desires and feelings are never more complicated than a single sentence could explain. Mario likes to move, he likes to jump, he likes to run, and doing so with the character is always meant to feel good. Mario is also an underdog. One hit from most enemies can kill him. And there are hundreds of them, but only one Mario. We love Mario because, well, he doesn't speak. Rather, is a man of action. One who faces adversity with a smile on his face. Mario communicates to the player that they should focus not on winning, not even necessarily high scores, but on play, on having a good time, on relaxation and fun. It can be difficult when you live through history to imagine things playing out any differently. But why couldn't Sonic, with his brazen daredevil attitude, be the face of video games? How about a Doom guy or a Master Chief? Those stern, aggressive military men. Why not a more complicated character like Solid Snake or, God forbid, any woman be the face of video games? Perhaps history could have played out differently, but we've only got one history to work with. And for what it's worth, it seems we ended up here because the innocent sense of play engendered in these characters feels like the reason why people like to play games in the first place. Unserious fun. Games absolutely can be and are more than this, but joyous, uncomplicated fun is their primary appeal to most people, or at least it was in gaming's early days. Pac-Man's characterization set that volleyball, and Mario spiked it. So, they rest atop the mountain as the most iconic video game characters. Mario is not just the most recognizable video game character though. He is the figurative embodiment of Player One. For the love of God though, we're not talking about Ready Player One, I'm talking about the first player, the one with their hands on the controller. The concept of Player One does not start with Mario, and we could argue that for most of history, nearly all games needed more than one player to be played at all, so they had some, everyone felt like they were player one while they were playing. But Super Mario Bros. absolutely helped construct the idea of player one as we know it today. In order for any video game to be played, there must be a player, and that is player one, for better or for worse. They aren't always called it, especially because there's no reason to delineate who is one when there are no other players. Player one, then, only exists in contrast to something, that being player two. I think you can see where I'm going with this. From a game design standpoint, player one demarcates who sits in the driver's seat. For instance, they usually control a game's menu. But player one is also a cultural concept. They are the player who owns the game, who owns the controller, owns the television. They run the show, they decide what is played. And in the case of Super Mario Bros, they get to go first. Player two, meanwhile, is second. They might be a visiting friend, a little brother, clamoring to get some screen time, player one's boyfriend, or anyone else. But in the classic conception of who is player one and who is player two or everybody else, they always come second. Their needs and wants matter less, because the developer has no assurance that they will be there in the first place. If player one doesn't like the game, they might return it, not buy its sequel, or criticize the game to others, hampering sales. 
If player two doesn't like a game, well, who cares? They probably didn't pay for it, and their experience of the game is typically so limited that their opinion will lack merit. I'm not saying games aren't designed with player two in mind, we just looked at it takes two to see that, but rather that their needs are often second in terms of design. Super Mario Bros. sets up a kind of tiered system between these players. Player one gets to play the game first, and player two gets to follow. The difference between them may seem trivial at first, but consider the disposition of player two. They have to watch the game being played. They see all the game has to offer, but have no power, no agency. Only after player one fails do they get a chance to play. But what do they play through? Everything they just saw player one do. Their experience is markedly different because unless they can exceed player one's performance, they won't encounter anything new. They will just follow in their footsteps. Player two is under a lot of pressure. If they can't be better than player one, they'll simply have to experience the game from the shadows. The idea of player one is that they are the explorer, the mover and shaker, the one who pushes the envelope and experiences new things. Player one, like Mario, is meant to be active, vibrant, full of life. Of course, the player playing as player one may not embody these characteristics, and perhaps the player playing player two could do better. But these are the qualities Super Mario Bros and many other games like it implicitly suggest these different players embody. In Super Mario Bros, like Mario Bros, Luigi is just a palette swap of Mario, a green version with all the same abilities, but the stain of player two on his clothes. Mario is famous. Whenever someone plays Super Mario Bros, they embody him. They run and jump and experience the game's challenges as him. Luigi is an afterthought. Only some of the time, certainly less than half, if anyone has ever played Super Mario Bros. solo, does the player even remember he exists. And even then, he's relegated to following the path Mario already laid before him. Though, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. After all, I said we'd primarily talk about player two, who Luigi is the metaphorical embodiment of in the last section of this video. So let's return to Mario. What does Mario get for being player one? He gets those dozens and dozens of games with his name in the title. He gets to appear in hundreds more. He'll always be the first option on every character select screen he appears on. The Prime Minister of Japan dresses up as him to promote the Olympics for Christ's sake. Of course, Chris Pratt plays him, because who else can empathize with having so many bizarre leading roles? Mario is the protagonist. Mario is the hero. Mario is the main character. It can't be any other way. He can't be number two or number three or number four or number five. Whoop. Oh, sorry. Where, were, where, where was I? Some may describe Mario as an unlikely hero, but that's only if we're working from the logic of television and film, where heroes are meant to be handsome, larger than life supermen. Mario absolutely is that, but he's also meant to be relatable. Because after all, everyone who plays a Mario game needs to believe on some level that they are Mario, that they could aspire to be Mario, that they could be the leader of their own life, not a follower of someone else. Ultimately, I'm not talking about solipsism here. We're all the main character of our own experiences. And Mario reaffirms the fantasy of being that main character, which is why he's so damn relatable. So let's return to where we started. What happens when player one is missing? What happens when the promise of fun and excitement disappear? What happens when we're meant to empathize and embody not the vision of protagonism, not the symbol of adventure, but their shadow, the one who follows but does not lead? What happens when the side character, whose primary purpose is to be as similar as possible to Mario, while being just different enough as to not cause confusion, is forced to assume the mantle and all the responsibilities of player one? What happens when Mario is missing? Well, 
I guess we get Luigi's Mansion. On June 8th, 1984, a year and a half before Super Mario Bros. would take the world by storm, a different multi-billion dollar mega franchise was born, Ghostbusters. Starring a variety of Saturday Night Live alumni, Ghostbusters tells the story of an upstart group of scientists who start a business and, in the process, save New York City from an eldritch entity beyond our comprehension. Though, if I need to tell you what Ghostbusters is about, well, a large part of why we're talking about Ghostbusters is moot. We're talking about Ghostbusters because its influence on Luigi's Mansion is significant. Just like how we can't understand Luigi without Mario, we can't really understand his mansion without the Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters is the Super Mario Bros. to Pac-Man's Star Wars. Wow, that feels like a stupid thing to say out loud, but bear with me. Pac-Man was the first video game to genuinely generate a high-pitched fever among the general populace. Heck, it spawned the Billboard charting song, Pac-Man Fever. Pac-Man was not just a game, it was a cultural phenomenon. Star Wars was like that, but for blockbuster cinema. It eventually took the throne of highest grossing movie of all time and revolutionized how films were conceptualized and marketed. The Star Wars franchise owes its success to just how good a movie Star Wars is, but what really put the industry on notice was how Star Wars established a brand. A brand is useful for all kinds of reasons. Sequels, spin-offs, merchandise, food packaging deals, clothing, conventions, attracting talent, and the list goes on and on. You can draw a pretty clear line between the media empire culture Star Wars kickstarted and the massive ball of intellectual property flesh Disney rolls around as today. Yet, just like how Pac-Man proved the concept of a hit video game and Super Mario Bros. reaffirmed it, Star Wars only showed that a hit film franchise was possible. Ghostbusters proved you could do it again. If you didn't grow up in the 80s, you might not realize just how big Ghostbusters was. But then again, I didn't grow up in the 80s. I mostly got the aftershocks of its popularity in my 90s childhood. Still, we can look at some historical evidence to show just how large Ghostbusters loomed in the American cultural conscience. Not only was it a hit film, it produced a number one song, which charted even higher than Pac-Man Fever. To try to give you a size of the scope of the Ghostbusters franchise, here is a list of different projects under the brand's name, and we'll limit ourselves to just the 80s. Two, feature-length films. A Saturday morning cartoon named The Real Ghostbusters, which ran for seven seasons and we could argue had its own spin-off show named Slimer. Two serialized comic book series, two original soundtracks, which both charted on the Billboard 200, three to 10 video games, depending on how you count them, countless toys and action figures based on the series' characters, including completely different lines for the show and the movie, food packaging, television commercials, and missing our deadline by just six months, the Ghostbusters Spooktacular special effects show at Universal Studios Florida. Suffice to say, Ghostbusters was everywhere. Television, radio, theater, video games, if an artistic medium was a vehicle for mass culture, the Ghostbusters brand was in on the action. Ghostbusters had such a totalizing media effect for likely dozens of reasons, and we can't possibly go over all of them today. Perhaps the best explanation is that it captured lightning in a bottle. But we can boil down its brand appeal primarily to the strength and endurance of the initial concept and subsequent film and the wide net it casts for an audience. Ghostbusters is an incredibly imaginative idea to base a film on, not unlike how Star Wars imagined an entire alternate universe from our own based on space travel. Perhaps its greatest success 
besides being so funny, is how it drags something so supernatural and unwieldy as ghosts into the real world. In theory, the existence of ghosts, or an eldritch god named the Destroyer, would be cause for great alarm and force human beings to rethink everything they thought they knew about themselves, the afterlife, and the cosmos. But Ghostbusters never bothers with such frilly philosophical predilections. Its characters are driven by a desire to make money off the ghostbusting business. Their dry humor in the face of cosmic horrors elevates the film as a work of fiction, but also strangely makes it feel grounded. It's primarily about some dudes trying to make a buck. Don't forget the film's famous catchline, who you gonna call, is taken from an advertisement for their services. The film derives its humor from the character's disposition toward their job and business. And that disposition, along with the wacky premise, makes Ghostbusters a memorable film worth watching again and again. Also, fun fact, it was the first movie I ever watched with my wife. Much more importantly for Ghostbusters' cultural juggernaut status, it's a film and franchise for everyone, but particularly children. The ghosts of the film were already cartoonish, and much of its humor, physical comedy reminiscent of early cinematic forebears, is the kind of thing that can make children and adults laugh. Cartoon shows, comic books, action figures, video games, these weren't meant for adults. They were meant to engender in a child a sense of personal identification with the franchise, to get them hooked. Today, these children have grown up, and their conception of their childhood years is oftentimes inexplicably linked to the iconography and emotions Ghostbusters fostered. Heck, just look at Stranger Things. Star Wars did the exact same thing, with toys and extraneous media properties intended for an audience whose personalities and tastes were not yet fully formed. In both cases, these mega franchises were built not off the back of a single film, but how that film's brand managed to stick to the most impressionable people who experienced it. By entertaining adults and children, both Ghostbusters and Star Wars cast a wide net and caught a lot of fish in the process, cementing their status as big ticket franchises rather than one-off films that made a lot of money. Importantly, Ghostbusters wasn't even the highest grossing film of 1984. That honor goes to Eddie Murphy's Beverly Hills Cop. But comparing them can be illustrative for the difference between a good film for making money and a good film for starting a brand. Ghostbusters does not have children as characters, but it's certainly geared towards them, as it's rated PG. Beverly Hills Cop, meanwhile, has topless women, realistic rather than cartoon violence, and a bevy of profanity. Murphy's comedy was a smash hit and managed to even spawn some sequels. But while Beverly Hills Cop may have won the Battle of 1984, it lost the war, at least the metaphorical one. It would ultimately prove itself to be a relic of the past, not just because of its dated humor, though the humor is dated, but because film production at the time focused on casting A-list actors to get butts in seats, and that was on its way out the door. That model is now mostly dead. The biggest actors in the world are subservient to the franchises they represent and the roles they reprise, not their innate charms and talents. Ghostbusters, despite leaning hard on the talents of its actors and writers, predicted the future we now live in. It's not actors, directors, writers, or unique concepts which inspire audiences to go to the theater. No, it's franchises, brands. Excluding 2020 because, well, you know. In the previous five years, 48 of the 50 top domestic films were sequels, remakes, or based on a pre-established intellectual property. The two exceptions are The Secret Life of Pets, which was always eyeing to become a franchise and then became one, and Free Guy, which borrows liberally from video game iconography in order to generate nostalgic familiarity similar to a brand. And oh yeah, a sequel to that is on its way as well. What does all this have to do with Luigi's Mansion, though? Well, 
The emphasis on branding was not lost on other media empires. While Ghostbusters was busy finding its way onto every packaging of every food product imaginable, Nintendo was building its own marquee media franchise with which to sell products. Video games are not immune to the emphasis on franchises, in fact are kind of susceptible to it, and most high grossing games are a sequel or remake of some kind. Most importantly for us today, Luigi's Mansion is an offshoot of the Mario franchise, the biggest brand in all of gaming. But Nintendo clearly didn't trust Luigi's tangential relationship to Mario or his brand to carry the game, or the console it launched with, so they borrowed from its cinematic franchise counterpart, Ghostbusters. Miyamoto denies this saying in an interview in the lead up to Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon, I am a fan of Ghostbusters. That wasn't the inspiration for the original Luigi's Mansion. In fact, when we were developing the original Luigi's Mansion, we were taking care as a team, even though that wasn't our original inspiration, to make sure that people didn't just assume that that was what we were trying to do. You've got to be kidding me, Shigeru. Can I call you Shigeru? I've quoted you, sometimes erroneously, in the past three elaborate reviews, and my channel's dumb name is a reference to a joke in one of your games. We're basically buds. Anyways, Shigeru, you've got to be kidding me. It wasn't our original inspiration. Your game reeks of Ghostbusters. Not only are both about capturing ghosts, an already pretty damn specific concept, but if the design of the ghosts in Luigi's Mansion were a metaphoric YouTube video, they would probably be unlawfully copyright claimed. In both instances, the game of capturing the ghosts is practically the same. First stun and immobilize them, then suck them into some kind of containment unit. The Ghostbusters wear a cumbersome backpack so they can use their cumbersome equipment, and so does Luigi. It certainly doesn't help that the original film is structured a bit like a video game either. The protagonists start out as weak losers, do a bunch of odd jobs, and then by the end of the narrative take on a god who threatens the world. If that isn't a JRPG plot, what is? The geeky scientist Egad, who wears a lab coat and looks like a cartoon Ghostbusters, sure sounds a lot like the Ghostbusters equivalent Igor, doesn't it? And in both media, characters have an obsession with money. Okay, listen, I know this is the most moldy bread of takes, but come on, Luigi's Mansion is a Ghostbusters game. Luigi's Mansion is a Ghostbusters game, Shigeru. It's also a Mario game, and not just any Mario game, a Mario launch title. You know, that thing Super Mario Bros was? No Nintendo console up until that point had ever launched without a Mario game. The Super Nintendo had Super Mario World, the Game Boy had Super Mario Land, the Nintendo 64 had Super Mario 64, the Game Boy Advance had Super Mario Advance, which was a remake, and even the Game Boy Color, which I don't really consider a fully new console, but more a soft reboot like the PS4 Pro, gave a different Mario character a whirl with Wario Land 2. Every major console Mario launch release, that's a mouthful, Super Mario Bros, Super Mario World, and Super Mario 64 did not just sell well, but was the best selling game on its console. Luigi's Mansion was the Green Bomber's moment in the spotlight. And to boost him, Nintendo frantically stole from the Super Mario Bros of cinema for some additional brand boost. If there was ever any time for Luigi to shine, this was it. And he fell flat on his face. Of course, it wasn't really his fault. The GameCube, despite in my humble opinion housing some of the best exclusive games for any console ever, faced too stiff of competition from the upstart Xbox and soon to be best selling console of all time, the PlayStation 2. It's easy to blame Luigi's Mansion in one way or another. It's not a marquee Mario game. Luigi doesn't really do Mario things, and while it sold fine, it failed to be the killer app the console needed. But the blood was already in the proverbial water, and Nintendo failed to meaningfully connect with mainstream audiences for the entire console generation. At the same time, Ghostbusters, and to some degree Mario, did not carry the cultural capital they did 15 years prior, 
and Nintendo's attempt to capitalize on Ghostbusters' popularity was a swing so late the pitcher was probably already home eating dinner. Sports metaphors. Yeah. Still, all failures aside, Luigi's Mansion is clearly intended to draw from Ghostbusters' success in a myriad of ways, even beyond thematic and aesthetic material. Whether or not the game sold well or reviewed well, its influences and the way it tries to adapt them into a Luigi-shaped mold are important to understanding what the game sets out to accomplish. The ghosts of Ghostbusters are not your standard creepy haunters, it's not a horror film. Outside of Gozer and the more demonic entities from an entirely different dimension, they don't seem to be filled with hatred, disgust, or violence. They are mischievous, yes, but lack any malice. The same can be said for most of Luigi's Mansion's antagonists, who not only look similar to Ghostbusters ghouls, but act in a similar manner. Only a few of the ghosts, King Boo in particular, have genuine ill will to administer. Luigi's Mansion's ghosts may not be Casper, but they sure as hell ain't poltergeist either. Their visual presentation ensures the game never veers too far into the horror genre typically associated with spectral phantoms. As I mentioned in my Miyamoto rant, Luigi's Mansion ludifies the Ghostbusters method for capturing ghosts in a way that just barely wouldn't result in a guilty verdict in a court of law. If we were to imagine a Ghostbusters game, and yes, I know they exist, shut up, we would imagine that we would aim our proton lasers at the ghosts to stun them, pull them into position over our containment unit, and then suddenly suck them up. Luigi's Mansion, in a genius reinvention, simply reverses the method. Luigi suddenly shines a light on them, a momentary flick of the wrist which lasts as long as the containment unit is open to capture the ghost and Ghostbusters. Then. Luigi sucks them up into his vacuum, which is longer and more drawn out, essentially replacing the beam portion of a Ghostbusters capture. We'll get into the specifics of the game's design more in the next section, but from a thematic perspective, capturing ghosts in the game feels like it should for a Ghostbusters game, even if the details are a little different. Luigi's Mansion captures the same grounded feeling as the Ghostbusters, but rather than achieving it through dry wit and a gritty New York atmosphere, it does so through the eponymous mansion itself. The mansion is a compact house with rooms you'd expect. Bedrooms, game rooms, bathrooms, etc. Luigi's traversal of the estate is relatively mundane. He just walks around its halls, slowly clearing it of mischievous ghosts. While the mansion has mystical properties, the player's experience of it as a basic layout for a large house stands in direct contrast to the fantastical nature of the ghosts who call it home. The contradiction between the mundane house and the supernatural subject matter evokes the same internal conflict which made Ghostbusters stand out. If every aspect of the game is mystical or magical, then the ghosts cease to be interesting. But if the ghosts are the only supernatural thing floating about, they become the star of the show, a truth both Ghostbusters and Luigi's Mansion implement well. Ghostbusters is a mix between comedy, adventure, and horror, and Luigi's Mansion follows suit. The horror elements are of course muted, and neither is the audience meant to be scared, but their imagery is clearly meant to evoke horror media. In Ghostbusters, the lack of horror elements is in part due to director Ivan Reitman's insistence. Michael Orvitz explains that Ivan would cut things out that were shocking to people. He was unmerciful. I've never seen anything like it. Luigi's Mansion, despite having a continually shocked protagonist, is also not particularly shocking for the player. The game lacks jump scares and its ghosts are deliberately shapeless. They aren't meant to frighten the player. They aren't all bloody or headless or whatever. This isn't Resident Evil, or is it? Stay tuned for the next section to find out. While Luigi's Mansion, with its limited dialogue, can't copy Bill Murray's humorous performance as Peter Venkman, it does try to cut the potential fright of his situation. 
with humor. Luigi is beautifully, and I assume painstakingly, animated to express emotions in an over-the-top and delightful way. His mannerisms are physical and Chaplin-esque. And don't forget, it was those old masters of comedy who in part inspired Dan Aykroyd and the crew of Ghostbusters. Luigi even tries to calm himself down by humming and whistling the game's iconic tune, an endearing trait reminiscent of the ways the Ghostbusters would make jokes to stay calm under pressure in their movie. Across their playtime in Luigi's Mansion, the player is meant to feel like they're on a comedic adventure. Each room will surprise them, yes, but both Ghostbusters and Luigi's Mansion understand that surprise is the essential foundation of both horror and comedy, a bridge they gap beautifully. So while the game does not capture the exact tone of Ghostbusters, it catches a similar wave. So, Ghostbusters is a genre-bending film about ghost hunting which, while not based on a pre-existing intellectual property, became a mega-franchise. And Luigi's Mansion is a genre-bending game about ghost hunting which, while not exactly based on a pre-existing intellectual franchise, is absolutely the stepchild of one. So they end up having a lot in common. The issue with Luigi's Mansion is people assumed it tried to be something it's not, and no, I'm not talking about Ghostbusters. In fact, it's probably the best Ghostbusters game ever made. No, Luigi's Mansion never tried to be a Mario game. That's its cardinal sin. Super Mario Bros. had two buttons, run and jump, and both are absent from Luigi's Mansion. When X-Play maligned it as an abomination, the worst Mario game of all time, wow, they specifically noted fans wanted a Mario game and got this instead. So Luigi's Mansion was judged against a measuring stick it did not care about. The initial backlash toward the game was intense, and while it softened over the years, the same reason it was made in the first place is the cause of much of the criticism surrounding it, the brand. Luigi's Mansion certainly sold better because it's a Mario game, I bet, but it also suffered under the burden of expectations. It suffered because instead of player one, we got a weird game with player two as the protagonist. Despite its best efforts, Luigi's Mansion simply doesn't fit the brand and was ostracized for it. I'm sad to say though that I bought into the anti-hype and in my youth was completely apathetic to Luigi's Mansion. Ghostbusters was old, old news. I was the prime target for the game, but I didn't have the cultural experience to nostalgically connect to its source material. I was just never really that interested in Luigi's exploits. The whole game seemed kind of lame to me, and it wasn't until much later that I finally gave it a whirl. I wonder now, how would I feel about Luigi's Mansion if I played it then, and not long after its release? Would I appreciate Ghostbusters more? Would my connection to the Luigi brand be more solid? Would I have been excited for the year of Luigi? Hard to say. But what I do know is that Luigi's Mansion, amongst a sea of great GameCube games, is often not remembered for its gameplay or story, or its ghost busting and ghost stealing concept. But for odds and ends like the game theorist using it to argue Luigi is the richest person in the whole Mushroom Kingdom. More on that in part four. In my experience, nobody really cares about Luigi's Mansion. Despite it sitting at the crossroads of two mega franchises, managing to straddle the line between them quite well. Because it just had the worst possible timing. What more could we expect from Luigi anyway? In the end, Luigi's Mansion is the first game in a franchise for a brand new console, which rarely if ever should communicate well thought out and developed ready to ship game. Despite all the excuses we could make for it, Luigi's Mansion is actually pretty fun and more importantly, interesting. It's a completely unique experience and has a game flow unlike pretty much anything else. It's, well, a joy. It's no Ghostbusters, it's definitely no Super Mario Bros, but why do we expect every game to be the exception to the rule? To be a killer app that will revolutionize the way you think about games? That's brand brain thinking, isn't it? 
If we meet Luigi's Mansion on its own terms though, we find a wonderfully interesting experience, which reveals a lot about games and how they convey meaning. So let's try to meet it on its own terms. Luigi's Mansion opens with our hero wandering through the forest at night. His flashlight illuminates only the small area directly in front of him. After checking his map, he looks up to see his supposedly beautiful mansion and finds not a luxury property, but an ominous and imposing structure. A buggy lies in ruin on the road leading up to the house. Two lights above the front door give off a pareidolia sensation. Not only is this mansion scary, it may be alive. Lightning strikes the ground a distance beyond the building, a telltale sign that this place is no good. Luigi approaches the building while a murder of crows looks from a distance. Crooked Dutch angles abound in the scene, setting the player at unease. Luigi opens the door and inquisitively asks, Hello? Before entering the domicile, though it's his house, why would anyone be here? Luigi's Mansion's short introductory cutscene tells us what kind of emotions it's trying to evoke. Horror, fright, fear. Every image across the first minute or so reinforces concepts of danger and precarity. Yet, like the protagonists and victims of nearly all horror media, Luigi is compelled to disregard his instincts, push forward and discover what this place is about anyway. The game's disposition toward horror extends beyond aesthetic, as it borrows just as much if not more from the tropes, themes, and mechanics of survival horror games as it does Ghostbusters and Super Mario. The way it threads the needle between each of these influences is what makes it interesting. Luigi's Mansion is a weird game. At times it feels more like a collection of game design pieces strewn together than a complete whole. To understand what it attempts to accomplish from a game design perspective, we need to examine what makes a survival horror game a survival horror game, and ask where and how Luigi's Mansion borrows from the genre while adding in elements of Miyamoto and Nintendo's playful, action-oriented design philosophy. But a more immediate question may have crept into your mind. Luigi's Mansion isn't scary. Doesn't a survival horror game have to engender fear in the player? Luigi's Mansion isn't even scarier than Boo's Haunted House from Super Mario 64. The only person jumping at this game scares is Luigi. The game doesn't even attempt to scare the player, so how can it be a survival horror game? Well, I don't believe scaring the player, or intending to, is necessary for a game to fall within the genre. We cannot judge a game to be or not to be survival horror based on whether or not it is scary, because fear is a player-experienced phenomenon and is in no way guaranteed. You can play Resident Evil, the undisputed template for the genre, and an undeniable influence on Luigi's Mansion, and never get scared, especially if you are going through the game for your second or tenth time. Meanwhile, I can tell you from experience that I've had a great deal of fear playing games not even meant to be scary. We can't define a genre purely by the emotions it elicits, because those emotions are the subjective domain of those who experience the game. We could say a survival horror game is one which intends to scare the player, but considering our conversation of Resident Evil 4, which is kind of a survival horror action game, way back in our elaborate review of Resident Evil Village, it seems many games firmly established within the genre don't spend a lot of time trying to scare their players either. We can approach the cultural construction of any genre in two directions. Genre can be the building blocks or tools an artist uses to craft their art. If I set out to make a role-playing game, I can look at what other games in the genre do and use them as my starting point for what I want to make. 
I could say, I want to make a turn-based RPG like Final Fantasy set in a bee colony. And there you go, we've got a soft pitch for what the game will look like, what building blocks we'll use. Genre conventions act as a playground for developers to play in. They offer limitations on what they can and can't do, and those limitations often inspire creativity. I hope no designer sets out and says, I want to make the most stock and trade real-time strategy game imaginable, but the concept of a real-time strategy game and all it entails offers a fruitful foundation for the kind of game they want to make. Part of the hype surrounding Death Stranding was the idea that it might generate a whole new genre of the Strand type game, which, considering the current stagnancy of AAA game development in regards to genre, might have been a breath of fresh air. Video games are ultimately expensive to make, and the bigger the production, the more developers tend to stick to the foundations of specific genres they know to be successful. Luigi's Mansion, for all its faults, does not fall into this pitfall, even if it conforms to various aspects of the survival horror genre. If you've seen some of my other videos, you know I tend to be less interested in creator intent and more interested in player experience. So we can also come at genre from the perspective of an audience and how genre shapes their expectations of a piece of media. If I go to a comedy movie, I expect to laugh. A drama, maybe I'll cry. A horror film, maybe I'll scream. The cult classic film The Room is a terrible drama, but a surprisingly good comedy. If you went to the theater expecting something emotionally moving, you'd be disappointing. If you were expecting to join in on some social fun watching a bad movie, you'll probably have a great time. When you play an action game, you expect to take charge, press buttons, do things, right? Take action. When you play a strategy game, you might expect to sit and think, plan ahead, be rewarded for your schemes and machinations. When I play a survival horror game, I expect the game will feature unsettling visuals, stressful mechanics, and require my morbid curiosity to keep moving forward. If you'll also recall from the village video, you'll know that I'm a scaredy cat, so it shouldn't take too much for Luigi's Mansion to scare me, but it really doesn't. Yet, I still think Luigi's Mansion is a survival horror game from both the perspective of developer intent and user experience, or at least has a lot of the flavors of the genre. Luigi's Mansion's developers clearly drew from the history of survival horror games when they designed the game. Perhaps the most obvious comparison is the original Resident Evil game. In Resident Evil, the player controls either Jill or Chris as they investigate the goings-ons of a now zombie-infested mansion. Strewn across the mansion are various keys, or plot MacGuffins, which act as keys like masks and crests. The player basically reenacts a kind of Rube Goldberg machine every time they play the game. Find the locked door, go get key, which unlocks the door only to find another locked door. And so then you gotta go find another key. Oops, that key is to a room you passed a while ago. Time to backtrack. Essentially, freedom is curtailed in favor of a tense back and forth experience running around the mansion in what would look like a nonsensical pattern if you were just following from the floor plan. Luigi's Mansion has the same structure, albeit a little more streamlined than Resident Evil. The player slowly uncovers literal keys through their playthrough, and each time they do, the game pulls up their map and tells them which room the key unlocks. Well, you know, streamlined for kids. While the design is far more plain than Resident Evil and generally lacks the wonderful aha moments where you find an item to unlock a room that you had long forgotten about, we cannot deny that Luigi's Mansion has the same Rube Goldberg machine design, just stripped of its many frills. Resident Evil is also known for its fixed camera positions. While technically a result of hardware limitations, as pre-rendered backgrounds are able to be much more detailed than the alternative, they still add a wonderful amount of cinematic flair to the game. The player only views each room from one angle, creating a sense of unease by hiding things from them or using bizarre canted angles to offer strange perspectives which feel unnatural. Luigi's Mansion does not have pre-rendered backgrounds, but it certainly does have a fixed camera, perhaps too fixed. Essentially, the player is privy to a flat 
and steady perspective from the side of the house. The camera rarely ever changes angles, but does track Luigi as he moves from left to right and up and down the floors. We view the titular mansion as though we are looking into a doll's house, which opens up and allows us to fiddle with its insides. Yet, unlike other Nintendo games, like the hard aesthetic of Yoshi's Woolly World, Kirby's Epic Yarn, or the Link's Awakening remake, Luigi's Mansion's camera feels less like an artistic decision meant to evoke a particular feeling of childhood, i.e. the dollhouse, in the audience and more a result of hardware and development limitations, just like Resident Evil's fixed camera. Though, future Luigi's Mansion games do carry the same camera. Still, I can't help but feel like Luigi's Mansion's camera at least tries, in its own incompetent way, to emulate a bit of what made Resident Evil's mansion so compelling. Resident Evil prominently features zombies as enemies, and while Luigi's Mansion's enemies are no zombies, its ghosts are a serviceable stand-in. Their purpose remains the same, to keep the player on their toes. In Resident Evil, zombies present a consistent threat as the player searches for the various keys to progress the game. When entering a new space, their first instinct should be to search for any who may be ready to attack, or lying in ambush. Luigi's Mansion, again, simplifies this play pattern. The player usually can't progress forward through a room, get the key they need, until they exercise its ghostly presence. The fundamental gameplay remains the same. While the player is en route to their destination, playing their part in the Rube Goldberg machine, they are accosted by ghoulish enemies, hoping to stifle their progress. One of the most potent survival aspects of a survival horror game are limited resources. Resident Evil limits practically everything. Healing items, ammunition, and even ink ribbons to save your game are in short supply. Luigi's Mansion, for the most part, lacks any real limited resource. While Luigi takes damage from ghosts and it isn't immediately easy to heal it, the player can always go back to certain locations and scrounge up hearts themselves. Similarly, they can only use the vacuum's elemental powers in short bursts, but refill ghosts are never too far away. At no point in what I would imagine is the typical Luigi's Mansion playthrough does the player have the classic Resident Evil decision of how are they going to take down the enemy down the hall, use their limited bullets safely, or put themselves in danger and use a knife so that they'll have ammo later. Limited resources ratchet the tension and make gameplay feel more consequential from moment to moment. Luigi's Mansion lacks this survival part of the genre, outside of the occasional sequence with no health pickups. So too do many other survival horror games, particularly those that might take after the walking sim genre. Some games just want to spook you or engender an emotion, not worry you with the details of how much space your shotgun takes in your inventory, or how many bullets you have left, or how many ink ribbons you can use to save. The aesthetic and vibe of Luigi's Mansion does much of the heavy lifting in regards to Resident Evil's influence. You could make a fixed camera angle Rube Goldberg machine with enemies and limited resources and not have a survival horror game, but you throw in a spooky aesthetic and it's kind of hard to deny. Luigi's Mansion is dimly lit, a haunted house with mischievous ghosts around every corner. The game even features door opening cutscenes like Resident Evil. As we noted with its opening cutscene, Luigi's Mansion wants you to think that on some level it's scary. Perhaps the game's cardinal sin as a member of the survival horror genre is that it isn't scary, but it's certainly scary for its protagonist. Luigi acts as the conduit for any potential fear, expressing it in such an outlandish way as to make sure that we don't feel scared. From any screenshot of the game, you'd probably get the impression that it's going for a horror vibe, though maybe one more charming than alarming. But it still importantly evokes the spirit of other survival horror games and its ghastliness. So many little touches in Luigi's Mansion sell you on the survival horror influence, from the disturbing image which haunts the pause screen, the Game Boy horror rather than Game Boy Color, de-emphasized combat, lots of backtracking, puzzles, and a general mysterious air about the game's location. Yet, we don't really consider Luigi's Mansion a survival horror game. 
Why is that? Well, what's weird about Luigi's Mansion is it takes cues from all these other horror games, but doesn't commit to them. Everything from its controls, to design, to visuals convey the same ideas as Resident Evil, but without their mechanical or aesthetic teeth. Luigi's Mansion feels like a game made by people who liked Resident Evil, but didn't fully understand why its systems harmonized so well with each other. Luigi's Mansion understands that keys work as wonderful gateways to progress, which make a small mansion feel much larger than it actually is, but instead of those aha moments where a player connects the dots with something they previously explored, they usually just have to suck up some ghosts and a key pops out of them. Luigi's Mansion understands that the threat of spooky games strewn across the mansion keeps the player engaged. But, because no meaningful resources are expended in their disposal, the player doesn't really have to think about how to deal with them. The game relies on spooks and scares to create a wonderful atmosphere, but doesn't seem to have an end goal. If the player isn't supposed to be scared, but the character is, where does that lead us? What are we supposed to take from the experience? You might think, at this point, I'd say, well, that wraps it up. Luigi's Mansion is a bad game, but I bring this all up not to shame it, but to point out how its influences initially seem to lead nowhere, like they hit an invisible design wall. Though I don't think that wall is so transparent, I think that wall is Luigi, or more specifically, the Nintendo's expectations for a Luigi game. I hope you're getting that Luigi's Mansion is a strange concoction. It's part Mario, part Ghostbusters, part Resident Evil, because the game doesn't fully know what it wants to be, because what a Luigi game is, was, and still is up in the air, because who Luigi is as a character is difficult to pin down. Out of this hodgepodge of influences though, we do get something pretty interesting. Perhaps the most surprising thing about Luigi's Mansion is just how confident the game is. Luigi's Mansion has a few novel tricks up its sleeves, and it wholeheartedly commits to those, if not its aesthetic or its Ghostbusters or Resident Evil. Chief among them is the Poltergust 3000, better known as Luigi's Vacuum Cleaner. The developers must have realized they struck gold with this house appliance because everything in Luigi's Mansion, gameplay-wise, revolves around the contraption. While its later iteration in Luigi's Mansion 3 is even more satisfying, it's a little astounding how much fun a game about capturing ghosts with a vacuum ends up being. The core gameplay loop of surprise ghosts with a light and then suck them up is not fun because that's something you've always wanted to do, like, I don't know, shooting bad guys with a gun, but because the developers added so many light decisions which make each action feel delightful. That classic Nintendo polish adding up to a sum much greater than its parts. For many ghosts, the core puzzle is figuring out how to surprise them so you can start sucking them up. For the average ghost, Luigi simply shines his flashlight on them. Unfortunately, the timid ghosts disappear if they see Luigi's light coming. Now, a lesser developer might have decided that it would be best to have Luigi press a button to turn on the flashlight, but not Nintendo EAD. You have to press a button to turn off the light. Luigi, afraid of the dark, doesn't want it off obviously, but more importantly, it's far more intense and interesting for the player to feel like they have to make a conscious decision to lure ghosts in by turning it off. Every time the player presses down on the B button, they relinquish safety for the thrill of the hunt. They wait with bated breath, anticipation building up as they scan the dark room for signs of the ghost. All the while, their finger firmly pressed on the button. They lure the ghost in closely, then turn around and shine it, stunning them and opening them up to the suck. In essence, to make the ghost vulnerable to his great suck attack, Luigi must first become vulnerable. Once stunned, the most satisfying and exciting part of the ghost catching process begins, sucking him up.
Since the player needs both thumbs on joysticks for this part, they hold the suck with the right trigger. You know, the tight grip, which naturally accompanies the big suck, makes the player physically clench their fist and feel the intensity of the moment with their body. The ghost, obviously not wanting to be sucked into the great beyond of Professor Egad's painting collection, attempts to flee Luigi's grasp. Here, the player must perform two tasks simultaneously. Maneuver Luigi with the left thumbstick and pull back in the opposite direction of the ghost on the C-stick. As the ghost frantically tries to escape, Luigi must avoid any other obstacles or ghosts to interrupt his suck attack. And the player must track the ghost's movement, constantly moving the C-stick around to lower the ghost's will to resist. When the ghost's will is reduced to zero, Luigi sucks him up. And they're never heard from again. The interplay between the two sticks is a joy, and catching ghosts in Luigi's Mansion never grows dull. It's exactly the kind of simple but deeply satisfying action Nintendo games are known for. The sound design of Catching Ghosts is a great example of classic Nintendo polish. A high-pitched ding rings out when the player flashes a ghost with their light, and they suck up the ghost. The vacuum beeps in a progressively higher pitches, again ratcheting up the tension, which is all the more fulfilling when the beeps end and the ghost is no more. The music also does an abrupt about face whenever Luigi has a ghost on the line, all of which signals we're entering a kind of minigame, but one so potent, varied, and fun that we don't mind playing it again and again. And again and again indeed. Perhaps the most confident element of Luigi's Mansion is its insistence that you replay it. The short runtime of the game is buoyed by an endgame ranking system, denoting how successful Luigi was finding treasure in his romp around the mansion. That treasure then goes towards building him a new, hopefully less haunted, abode. Each playthrough of Luigi's Mansion ends then not with a satisfying bow atop the narrative and a job well done given to the player, but an encouragement to try again and do better next time. In some ways, it scratches a similar itch to other survival horror games, where replays also tend to be incentivized in one way or another, most commonly because the player now knows the location of many of those secret items and keys which might make the run easier. While Luigi's Mansion's secrets don't often impact the difficulty of its gameplay, that tends to not be a problem, since it's not really supposed to be a difficult game. I hit one game over screen in my entire playthrough, and that was on the final boss because I moronically couldn't figure out how to hurt him. <laughs> Suffice to say, Luigi's Mansion has a twinge of arcade sensibility in its design. It's a four to six hour game that begs you to try again when you complete it. Confident, its core gameplay loop is fun enough to get you to start over again. A confidence which is not misplaced. And if you want to learn more about it, check out Liam Triforce's retrospective on Luigi's Mansion, because he sings its praises in this regard better than I can. Though Luigi's Mansion's length was a primary avenue for criticism in the game's early days, GameSpot named it the most disappointing game of 2001. Luigi's Mansion's 5 to 10 hours of simplistic gameplay and lack of replay value makes it a real disappointment. In their review, GameSpy wrote, Luigi's Mansion lacks any kind of longevity or replay value and can become a tad repetitive. And by their score byline is even more blunt. Way too short, too easy little replay value. Liam Triforce argues these criticisms were primarily the result of the limited amount of time reviewers have to look at games before coming to a conclusion, whereas Luigi's Mansion is a game that grows on you over time. Personally though, I think a much more insidious culprit lies behind these complaints. Luigi's Big Bro. Multiple contemporaneous reviews I read specifically mention Mario and Zelda games in their review, and explicitly compare Luigi's Mansion to them. But as we've detailed in this section, Luigi's Mansion is far more indebted to even Resident Evil for its gameplay and style than it is any Mario or Zelda game. And even then, 
Luigi's Mansion still strikes out to be its own unique thing. I know why reviewers made these comparisons. The GameCube just came out. Super Mario 64 and The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time were the killer apps of Nintendo's previous console. People wanted new iterations on those franchises, but with the GameCube's release, they only got two first-party Nintendo games. Luigi's Mansion and Wave Race Blue Storm? The absolute burden of being the only marquee game on the console at its release meant it was unfavorably compared to games everyone agreed were at the top of their field. In reality, Luigi's Mansion was developed by a small team who didn't even know they were making a Mario game when they started out prototyping, and was far more unique and novel than polished, and featured not one of Nintendo's leading characters, but the leader of the sidekicks, Luigi. In the end, no GameCube game would end up outselling Super Mario 64 or Ocarina of Time, but they would remain the yardsticks every game on the console was compared to. It's so ironic then that Luigi's Mansion predicted the way things were heading more than those two titles anyway. Nearly every big ticket franchise for the GameCube followed its formula. Familiar character, unfamiliar or exotic place, some fresh gimmick to set it apart from what came before. Wind Waker is set on an open sea and has a boat for a companion, something no Zelda game has done at such scale before or since. Mario Kart Double Dash couldn't separate itself from its racetracks, but it introduced the two drivers, one kart gimmick, making it the only Mario Kart game to break from that tradition. Perhaps the biggest departure, and most signposted by Luigi's escapades though, is Super Mario Sunshine. A game set in a tropical paradise, pretty much the opposite of a cramped haunted mansion, but still unique by Mario standards, where Mario pals around with his talking backpack appliance named Flood. Flood may be more thought out than Poltergust 3000, you know, they can talk, but come on, they're both backpacks, which augment Mario characters developed by Professor Egad. I doubt Sunshine was made in response to Luigi's Mansion, but rather the writing was on the wall. Nintendo didn't want to just release Super Mario 64 2 or Ocarina of Time 2. They had just made the jump to 3D, the possibilities were wide open, and they wanted to stretch their legs and run. Luigi's Mansion, then, is the first step of that journey. And while not a particularly successful financial step, it was one which would ultimately lead to where the company is today. If for being as uncharitable as possible, Luigi's Mansion is a Mario game without a jump button. What a sad state of affairs. If we're choosing kindness, as you often should, Luigi's Mansion is a bold reimagining of both its central character and what a first party Nintendo game could look like. Someday, we'll cover more Nintendo 64 games, but across the board, most of its titles are safe journeys into three dimensions. Games like Star Fox 64 and Mario Kart 64 mostly iterate on concepts familiar to the audience from previous games. Meanwhile, those big, important games like Legend of Zelda and Super Mario 64 may be instant classics, some of the most memorable games many have ever played, but they absolutely lean hard into their franchise's histories, succeeding primarily in carrying over what they could from their forebears. I'm not saying they aren't creative or wonderful. Trust me, they are. What I'm saying is that with their first 3D console, Nintendo played it safe. With their second, they wanted to take chances, and with their third, we'll see the biggest chance of all. Luigi's Mansion, what we might call the first Nintendo game for the console, tells us exactly what to expect moving forward. More of this. The fact that it's actually a pretty damn good game, one which activates on a whole different set of expectations than we'd expect, is praiseworthy, not condemnable as the reviewers of the time continually suggested. So yeah, Luigi's Mansion is a complicated, fixed camera, survival horror, collect-a-thon, action-adventure, Ghostbuster-inspired mystery Mario game without Mario. Which is certainly a mouthful. But that mouthful is what makes the game exciting. Do you know what doesn't make the game interesting at all though? 
Asking whether or not Luigi is a billionaire, or if Egad betrayed Mario and set up the events of the game. In the next section, we're going to discuss just how little some of the most popular discussions of Luigi's Mansion have to offer us. While I was writing the script for this video, and after I'd already come up with the idea for this section, the YouTuber Zoomzyke released their video, Should You Buy Luigi's Mansion? And not the game, but the mansion itself. Now, to be fair to my fellow creator, the video was made as part of their June Zoom, where they released a video every day for a month, which sounds like a nightmare to me. So I don't intend to take it too seriously. But the title hit on exactly the kind of game theory I'm interested in talking about in this part of the video. It suggests a highly literal reading of Luigi's Mansion, where we try to determine just how much the blasted place is worth. In the video, Zoomzike explores the interior of Luigi's Mansion, makes ample use of the photography feature within the game, and discusses the layout of rooms and items within. All in all, it's a fantastic look at just how much attention to detail went into the game's environment. But that central question of should you buy it nags at me. If you've been on the gaming side of YouTube long enough, you've probably heard of MatPat, or rather, you are probably familiar with his channel, The Game Theorists, or his other channel, The Film Theorists, or his other other channel, The Food Theorists. The guy and his production crew have two channels with over 10 million subscribers, and another with 3.72 million. I'd say that's pretty amazing. If I were them, I would be quite proud of myself. Yet, the word theorist, which ties all these channels together, feels pretty liberally applied. As someone who has unfortunately studied theories of digital games for my PhD, it feels a little bit, well, not exactly what I'd call game theory. Though, two things before we dive into this discussion. First of all, my purpose is not to craft a no true game theorist argument. That would be stupid. The word theory is purposefully abstract, refers to all sorts of things. Economic theory is different than scientific theory, which is different than game theory, which is different than theories of games. I'm not just talking about the topics either, I'm talking about their methodologies and how they understand what a theory is in the first place. The concept of a theorist is broad enough to include both Matt, Pat, and I. So when I talk about game theory, I'm mostly interested in drawing a contrast between differing definitions with a broader point on how we talk about games. Second. I have no interest in dragging other people. That's not the point of my videos and would only detract from them. I personally haven't watched many of MatPat's videos, am generally unfamiliar with any controversies they may have, and obviously don't know any of their staff personally. I am also fully aware that the game theorists and me are in completely different lanes as video creators. Their videos are supposed to be funny and entertaining and aren't meant to educate. While I try to give you a nugget of thought to chew on and mull over, hopefully show you that video games are avenues for profound and interesting meaning. As we saw in the Elaborate Ring Elaborate Review, it can be useful to bring in other people's ideas to help formulate your own. So, in this section, I'm interested in looking at the game theorist videos on Luigi and Luigi's Mansion and asking where that avenue of criticism leads us and if that's a useful place to be. Luigi, Luigi's Mansion, or the franchise's characters are by my count the central topic of four different game theorist videos. Many of MatPat's videos cover the Mario series, so Luigi is bound to show up in them, but these four have Luigi in the thumbnail or are far more directly related to Luigi's Mansion than the others. All of these videos are four or more years old, all have a generally conspiratorial mindset seeking to upend the way one might traditionally understand Luigi 
and the Mushroom Kingdom. One of these is an April Fool's Day video measuring the size of Luigi's... Okay, we're not gonna go there. The other three all focus on Luigi's Mansion in one way or another. One seeks to evaluate Luigi's net worth based on the end game score the player receives at the game's conclusion. One argues that Luigi has a secret identity as Mr. L, the nefarious alter ego villain from Super Paper Mario, because hypnosis can only make you more of what you already are. Finally, that's my cat. Finally, one accuses Professor Egat, who first debuted in Luigi's Mansion, of giving destructive items to villains in the Super Mario series because he's money hungry. Across these three videos, we get a healthy sampling of the game theorist's idea of game theory. So let's take a look at each of them to understand what that is. The video Game Theory, Super Mario Betrayed covers Professor Egad's supposedly duplicitous nature, and unlike the other two videos, it primarily only uses information found in Super Mario games to make its claims. The basic gist of the argument is that the conflict of multiple Mario games is started by the professor's machinations. In Super Mario Sunshine, the paintbrush Bowser Jr. uses to vandalize Delfino Island was probably invented by Egad since it carries his logo. And he also created Flood, Mario's trusty tool in removing the graffiti it makes. MatPat makes a big deal out of the fact that Bowser Jr., who would never lie, says that an old man gave him the paintbrush. But Flood was purchased for Mario, implying that the purpose of the paintbrush is to manufacture a problem that the Flood can then solve. And Egad in the process rakes in cash. The video points to other examples of Egad instigating conflict, like Mario and Luigi Partners in Time, where the professor makes a time machine, but it ends up getting Princess Peach stuck in the past, so Mario and Luigi have to travel to save her. And Luigi's Mansion, Dark Moon, where the conflict is kickstarted when Egad sells the essence of King Boo trapped in a painting in a garage sale. Each of these instances could be chalked up to the professor being overconfident or absent-minded, but we'll get to that in a moment. Most relevant for our discussion of Luigi's Mansion is Matt Pat's argument that Professor Egad is the villain of the tale. The game theorists rely on a few pieces of evidence to make the claim. First, the ghosts mostly don't bother with Luigi unless he bothers them, indicating they are not his enemy. Second, why didn't Egad warn Mario not to go in the suspicious mansion? And then, why didn't Egad do anything about it? Third, it's awfully convenient Mario got turned into a painting when the only character we know who can reverse a character trapped in a painting or put them in a painting in the first place is Egad, implying that the professor might be the one who captured Mario in the first place. Now, I could disprove these theories by pointing out that Luigi has to bother the ghosts to get his brother back, as they are the gatekeepers or er, key keepers of the game. So it's not like the professor misleads Luigi into capturing these ghosts. Rather, he correctly explains capturing them is the only way to reunite with Mario. I could say that Egad didn't know the mansion was haunted, and moreover, the beginning of the game seems to suggest he did head in to the mansion to rescue Mario, but was thwarted because he's not a buxom hero like Luigi. I could also note that King Boo canonically can turn people into portraits, and takes credit for putting Mario in the portrait in, in the narrative of the game, and he tells Luigi that he's next. Not to mention Mario's portrait is animated, clearly containing his like soul. And Egad's portraits don't have this quality, indicating some other kind of entrapment. Maybe less magical, more scientific. Well, I did just note all those things, but doing so just plays into Matt Pat's game theory hand. It doesn't matter if the text of the game easily disproves the Egad betrays Mario narrative he sets up, because if I engage with it on that level, pointing out the literal consistencies and inconsistencies within the story, I I'm still playing the game theorist game. Instead, much simpler and more satisfying answers exist. 
The ghosts don't attack Luigi because they are all puzzle bosses. They break up the pacing of the game with their nonchalant attitudes, offering the player a change of pace from more action-oriented sequences. It offers the game and its ghastly residence an air of mystery and intrigue develops their characters, which is critical for the light horror adventure vibe the game's got going on. EGAD didn't warn Mario about the mansion because Mario getting captured is the point. It's Luigi and the player's motivation to rescue him. Egad is the only friendly non-toad NPC in the game, so his job at the beginning of the story is to give the player exposition, including giving them details on why they should venture into the haunted mansion, rather than running away from the ghosts like any sensible person would. Finally, portraits are an important symbol in Luigi's Mansion. Most of the game's ghosts are portraits from a Van Gogh facsimile come to life, not literal dead spirits. Luigi and Egad turn them back into paintings, both as a display, like in an art museum, and as a prison, which figuratively reflects their dead disposition. Their collection and exhibition resembles a kind of cemetery. Spooky. The subtext is pretty interesting when you think about it, so it's fitting Mario himself would be trapped in a painting as it means he can't escape on his own, because his prison is metaphysical and his fate mirrors the ghosts Luigi captures. So every time the player makes more ghostly paintings, they are reminded of their ultimate goal to free Mario from his. The issue with these three counters to Matt Pat's argument that Egad is secretly evil is they don't rely on the text of the game, but the fact it was made by people. People with goals and ambitions who made a piece of art with limited resources and tried to tell a story. While the various theorist channels sometimes use the words and ideas of creators to fuel their theories, most of the time, the idea that a piece of media is constructed with a vision in mind seems absent from their formulations. Now sure, I'm all for death of the author, but as an English PhD candidate and a college instructor, can I just note that that phrase is like way overused in media discourse? The historical context for the phrase is important. At the time, many scholars treated an author's intentions or perceived intentions as the last word or the meaning of a piece of art, narrowing the amount of possible interpretations significantly. As the final ultimate reading provided by the author was the most valid or important one. The phrase was never intended to completely disregard a work's context, but open up more opportunities for considering its meaning and significance. I like to think we do that in these elaborate reviews by focusing on the player's experience of playing games. A video like Super Mario Betrayed, though, goes in the polar opposite direction. It doesn't really imply or consider a work of art might be made by someone with something to say, but instead treats it like a puzzle box, which if they can arrange in just the right way, will say whatever they want. Ultimately, that's a kind of vapid analysis, as instead of interrogating the meaning of a work and why it's significant, the game's narrative and characters are just simply pieces to move around on a chessboard for the purpose of creating the most tantalizing title and thumbnail for a prospective audience. Which that's a little harsh, but I guess I, I mean it. <laughs> the other two Luigi videos covering his alter ego and net worth are similar to each other and that each uses real world information to try to understand a fictional video game character. We'll start with the one less concerned with Luigi's Mansion, but certainly still relevant for our discussion, Luigi's secret identity. The video covers Luigi's appearance in the Wii's Super Paper Mario. In the game, Luigi is hypnotized by the Big Bad's secretary, Nastasia, and takes on the villainous guise of Mr. L, a confident, albeit evil, version of Luigi. The game theorists make the argument from research into the real world phenomenon that hypnosis can't make a person do something they wouldn't do in the first place. Meaning, Mr. L isn't just a brainwashed Luigi, but has existed under Luigi's cowardly exterior all along. Once his mental inhibitions are removed, he is free to be sarcastic 
flirty and antagonistic, as opposed to his traditional, more amicable traits. Now, we could note Nastasia's hypnosis is established as able to make characters do things they absolutely do not want to do, chief among them forcing Princess Peach to marry Bowser. She rejects him three times, but once under Nastasia's spell, she gives in. I will note, holy shit, watching that scene again is so damn creepy. Nastasia, don't betray your fellow lady like that, jeez. Anyway, that would be playing the game theorist's game, so let's not do that. Instead, let's ask two important questions. Why are they applying the real-world phenomenon of hypnosis to its representation in a video game? And is their research into hypnosis valid or accurate? As to the first question, it bears mentioning that the representation of hypnosis in a video game will not necessarily correlate to how it functions in the real world. In fact, it clearly doesn't in the case of Super Paper Mario. For instance, in the scene where Nastasia brainwatches Peach into marrying Bowser, we see a visible magical effect take over and physically debilitate the princess. In such a situation, why would we ever imagine her hypnosis would work by the same rules the actual human phenomenon of hypnosis does? Isn't it far more likely that the story writers of Super Paper Mario used a concept its players would be familiar with for dramatic tension? Again, by taking the events of the game so literally, MatPat fails to consider that Super Paper Mario is a work of art, and consequently, he treats Luigi as a character in a true crime documentary, rather than, you know, a fictional dude. Moreover, the theorist's research into hypnosis leaves much to be desired. He first cites the FAQ page of the North Carolina Society of Clinical Hypnosis, which claims 85% of people are capable of being hypnotized. But A, this organization is a small nonprofit with a vested interest in making claims about the efficacy and power of hypnosis. B, the 85% number does not cite any external study. For all we know, they made it up. And C, FAQ pages are not good places to do research, and certainly not good places to cite. MatPat then swerves into, well, this is all malarkey though, right? Before saying, well, no, actually my friend got hypnotized once. The focal point of the discussion is not expert opinions or academic studies, but his experience seeing a fellow YouTuber hypnotized at a conference. Anecdotal evidence is completely fine to use as a starting point, but Matt Pat's discussion bases conclusions off of a single experience with a friend. Remember, he posited that hypnosis might not be real, then immediately pivoted into the story of his friend being hypnotized. He explains, looking at my own personal experience from watching that show, it seems pretty clear that the hypnosis happened pretty fast though he doesn't bother to note that the people up there pre-selected themselves for a performance and that they were all primed and relaxed while on stage before the hypnotist figuratively snapped their finger. To compare, this personal experience of seeing one person quickly hypnotized in a public setting with Luigi's hypnosis in a video game is such a weird and strange stretch. But we're not done. After examining Luigi's psychology a bit further, the theorists come to the conclusion it turns out Luigi's behavior can't be explained by hypnosis. His evidence, the beginning of the YouTubers Get Hypnotized video where the performing hypnotist tells the performers, hypnotist is what you imagine it to be. But the guy on stage is a performer. His goal is to entertain the audience, not give an accurate picture of hypnosis. Using him as a source for your theory is about as good as trusting a politician to not misrepresent a statistic or a game theory video to be even remotely educational. A moment later, Matt Pat says, in my research, dot dot dot, and quotes three different sources on whether hypnosis can get someone to do something they don't want to do, except all three of the sources are, again, from the FAQ pages of hypnosis practitioners. These are biased sources. I'm not going to try to bother to disprove hypnosis here. That's not the point. 
Rather, I want to show that no due diligence was done here as to whether or not this information about hypnosis is accurate, or if it was done, it's not being shown to the viewer. This is where I get a little peeved, because to some degree, in episodes like this, the game theorists veer towards being educational content, seeking to teach their often young viewers about something they just don't know about. In such circumstances, they have some amount of responsibility not to do the worst possible research, either anecdotal or blatantly biased, and then pass it off as authoritative. When I asked some mutuals about the channel and read a little bit from their Reddit, I found a general perception that the Game Theorist videos are meant to be entertaining and educational to some degree. Yet, content is educational only if the information held within has some value, right? All the channel's research into hypnosis is used to make the argument that Luigi isn't acting against his own will and that Mr. L is the true form of Luigi, his thoughts and his ambitions. Now, I think we've already done enough to show that the way we got to this conclusion was inherently flawed. But more importantly, why does this conclusion matter? What does Mr. L being Luigi's true form, whatever that means, tell the player about you or me. Art has an amazing capacity to explore and communicate our experiences, but if you watch this video, you wouldn't be able to tell. It would appear that art is mostly just a little puzzle box that you can shift around and make funny pictures with, with no meaning. I want more though. I want another 10 minutes of this video, even if we accept the flawed logic that Luigi has this secret identity, you've got to explain to me why I should care, how it relates to me, or you, or anyone's experience in the world. And before anyone starts typing up in the comments why Luigi's alter ego matters to them or what meaning they can derive from it, I didn't ask you about it. I asked the people who made the video. I too could come up with reasons why Mr. L being Luigi's genuine subconscious could be interesting, even if I don't believe it. But I'm asking why the game theorists rarely explain the significance of their own conclusions. They often make the conclusion and that's that. Anyway, let's talk about the video most directly linked to Luigi's mansion. Luigi, the richest man in the Mushroom Kingdom? This video, as far as game theorist videos go, is pretty par for the corpse, as it attempts to find the financial value of the game's titular mansion. I will give this video credit. In the previous section, I described Luigi's Mansion as a Rube Goldberg machine of a video game, and this is a Rube Goldberg machine of a video. The form of the video mirrors the game, and I find that pretty neat. MatPat first calculates Luigi's height, and then uses that to determine the mansion's square footage. From there, he looks into the house's architectural details and determines its value at just under a million. The twist is that he then evaluates all the coins and gold bars and everything that Luigi finds in the mansion, and comes to the staggering number of $500 million. Wow, Luigi sure is a rich boy. Well, perhaps the second stupidest premise of any of these videos we're looking at today, you know, behind the dick measuring contest, I probably like this one the most, precisely because it's so silly. Yet, what do we gain when we calculate Luigi's net worth? Does it cause us to change how we view his character or his role as Mario's sidekick? Is it ever brought up again in any other Mario game? Is Luigi's massive wealth ever used to make some kind of economic or social commentary? Okay, so literally in the universe of Mario, this is already malarkey, but do we learn anything about our world in the process? Someone unfamiliar might learn a little bit about architecture and real estate, but not really. That's not really the focus of the video. Perhaps an interesting story could reside in this video. Maybe a point could be made about how financial value is often held in property, not labor. I mean, Luigi didn't work for a single thing in the mansion, so why is he entitled to all that wealth? But now, I'm trying to turn the theorist video into something it's not, which seems to be the running theme of this section, no? Okay, 
now that we've talked about these videos, let's take a step back for a moment and ask, why do you care, Mrs. Error? I care for a few reasons. I'm interested in Luigi, who we'll talk about a lot more in the next section, and we don't need this character assassination. <laughs> I also find this kind of analysis and theory crafting is a strangely dominant way many people talk about video games or films or TV shows, and I find that concerning. It's not always as explicit as the Game Theorist videos. Sometimes it's one of those millions of insert game or movie iceberg explained videos you keep getting recommended on your YouTube homepage, which are never interesting in my experience. Sometimes it's mentioning a game or movie you find interesting and suddenly the only thing the person you're talking to wants to talk about is if Mario was dead the whole time in Super Mario 64 or something stupid like that. Sometimes it's people simply prioritizing what is or is not canon over what a piece of media means and why it matters. Taking after Transparency's great video on reviewer brain, I think I'll call this theorist brain. Theorist brain is when someone gets so caught up with literally reading the contents of a game, they completely miss the forest for the trees. These theorists are not interesting analysis of the media they interrogate. They instead mostly seek to shock the viewer. Is Mario secretly a communist? Does Luigi have a big dong? Sure, these make for good thumbnails, but they usually lead to vapid videos. It maybe could have been interesting if they turned their conclusion that Mr. L is Luigi's true identity into something interesting to say about the human condition. But the theorist brain is satisfied having simply made some connection, any connection, and calling it a day. Because the ends of the theory, i.e. getting people to click on your video or article, matter more than the means by which you got there. You may be thinking, well, maybe you're taking this too seriously, lady. After all, it's just a theory, a game theory. These videos are just entertainment, but boy howdy, do I hate that logic. One game theory video probably takes as many labor hours, if not more, than one of these elaborate reviews, and of course receives millions more views. I'm genuinely happy for their success. YouTube is big enough for both of us. I figure quite a few people have jobs because of that channel, so to belittle all that work and then use it as justification for why the output couldn't be more thoughtful is befuddling to me. People spend millions of hours watching these videos, so intentionally or not, they change the way their viewers see video games, how they read them, how they understand them. Moreover, for many people, particularly children, this may be their first exposure to any kind of video game analysis. So why wouldn't I want it to be good analysis? Even if you believe it's silly or just entertainment, it's meant to evoke intellectual discussion and thought. Explore characters and real world topics. Is it so much to ask that it have a little heart? Maybe, I don't know. That's just an argument, an elaborate argument. On February 14th, 2013, Nintendo had a Nintendo Direct. Wait, really? They've been going on for that long? Geez. Only a few months after the release of the Wii U. Fans may have wondered what new games were in store for the console, but they received a strange sight. Satoru Iwata, may he rest in peace, appeared on screen with a Luigi hat on. He briefly explained the character's history, and that it was his 30th anniversary before declaring 2013 the year of Luigi. Miyamoto even showed up in his first ever direct to talk about the 3DS's Luigi's Mansion, Dark Moon. He did not don a Luigi hat though. By the end of the year, we would also see New Super Luigi U, Mario & Luigi Dream Team, Dr. Luigi, and Luigi Bros. As his game did with the GameCube, Luigi was only the harbinger of bad news for Nintendo, who would post one of their worst years in recent history due to the failure of the Wii U to catch on with audiences. 
Some might have even blamed Luigi for the problem, but let's be real, Nintendo had already dug its grave. It's not Luigi's fault he was on the tombstone. Still, I can't help but feel like tragedy befalls Nintendo whenever they turn toward Luigi for help or to support him. Don't worry though, this story has a happy ending. Throughout this video, we've discussed how Mario is video games player one. How Luigi's Mansion failed to live up to the blockbuster status of a console release Mario game, or Ghostbusters. We've talked about the game's fun and dynamic gameplay which refuses to be easily defined, and why Luigi seems to be a lightning rod for fan theories. And now, it's time to turn toward Luigi himself. Who is Luigi? What does Luigi mean? Why should you care about Luigi? Well, because Luigi is the most famous doppelganger in games, and most importantly, he is player two, personified. Fudge. Throughout season one of these elaborate reviews, we have considered a variety of ways in which video games employ doppelgangers for thematic, narrative, and ludic tension. When discussing Resident Evil Village, we noted that the Ethan the player controls is but a fungal copy of the original character, a doppelganger if you will. We asked what kind of copy he's supposed to be to grow into, and found it to be the idealized father figure. When I reviewed Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, we considered how Wolf, the game's central character, emulates the swordsman on display in the game's introductory cutscene, only to have to fight Ishin Ashina, that same swordsman, as the game's final boss. A potent thematic fight about how the player is supposed to approach that action game. 2020's Omori brought us even more feel for the fire, as the game is divided between Sunny's real world and Omori's fantasy land, the conflict between these two characters and the two worlds in which they reside is the core narrative device of the game and reaches its peak in the game's heart-wrenching conclusion. We then found ourselves in the land of Advance Wars, whose entire conflict is kicked off because a clone of the main character is used to make a false flag attack against the other nations, pitting the countries of Cosmoland against each other. We use the complete absurdity of the plot to argue that all war is equally absurd. Finally, when analyzing Elden Ring, we spent an entire section considering the thematic and ludic impact of the Mimic Tier, the game's most interesting spirit ash. Across each of these elaborate reviews, each of these doppelgangers, we found incredibly varied meaning. Some doppelgangers challenged the player to battle, others were overcome with melancholic music, still others were allies in the player's journey. Each one told us more about the characters we embodied and the meaning of their games. Yet, one doppelganger looms large in the background, fulfills all these criteria. Luigi. Village's protagonist is a copy of the original Ethan Winters. Luigi is a copy of the original Mario. Wolf emulates and defeats the Master Swordsman. Luigi emulates his brother, the Master Jumpman, but ultimately jumps higher than he ever could. Okay, I'll admit, that one's a little bit of a stretch. Sunny and Amori must reconcile to find peace, and in every Mario and Luigi game, the pair work together to overcome the Mushroom Kingdom's woes. Andy and Clone Andy find themselves on opposite sides of a conflict, not unlike Mario and Luigi in every Mario sports game, or with Mr. L as we saw in the Game Theorist discussion. The Mimic Tier is one of gaming's greatest companions, but Luigi is not just the greatest companion, he is THE companion, THE doppelganger. All others are measured against him. I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? If Mario is the closest thing we have to a main character of all video games, then Luigi would make sense as the closest approximation to companion. In most respects, I think we can argue Luigi is a more interesting character than Mario though. Mario is a Mary Sue, he's good at everything, he's got no real personality because he is meant to be a stand-in 
for the player. As we noted in section one, Mario shares the bulk of his personality traits with Pac-Man. And let's just say, nobody's making blockbuster movies starring Pac-Man except Adam Sandler, kind of. Luigi, on the other hand, exists in contrast to the nothingness Mario provides. What do you do with a character built to both resemble and contrast someone with little to no personality traits? You make a character with all of the personality traits. Luigi is, at various points, described as cowardly, naive, trusting, innocent, defender of the downtrodden, loyal, soft touch, not a bumbling fool. Wait, that's just the bio from the Super Mario Bros. 3 bio. He is also described as timid, jumps right into harm's way, clumsy, Mario would be lost without him, scared, not afraid to stand up to ghosts, a well-rounded driver, not so mean, able to fall asleep at the drop of a hat, dependable, not riding Mario's coattails, but tailgating him instead, steady, pretty good at everything, believing he is better than golf at Mario, fashionable but not very functional, once overlooked, shy and awkward, modest, pretty brave in his own right, even if he's scared of ghost monsters and everything, kind-hearted, and my personal favorite, notable for his green hat, his jumping ability, and nothing else. If Mario is an everyman by way of his lack of definable characteristics, Luigi is an every one. Any one of us could find parts of ourselves in Luigi's multiplicity. Put a pin in that. We'll return to it later. Luigi is a bit of an odd doppelganger. Not just because imagining the opposite of Mario is tricky, though more on Wario in a moment, but whereas we usually focus on what the clone has in common with the original, in Luigi's case, what differentiates him from Mario is all that matters. Or to put it another way, usually the original defines the duplicate, like Superman defines Bizarro. But Mario is more defined by not being Luigi than Luigi is defined by not being Mario. When we see Mario next to Luigi, someone who can be a hero but is somehow also clumsy, scared, shy, and awkward, we understand who Mario is better. Mario is perfect, exceptional. Mario is not everyone because really he's not anyone because he's designed to be maximally relatable. I know this sounds like circular logic, so let me try to explain it in another way. Mario, as a character, is first and foremost someone designed to connect to anyone, anywhere. But the logical consequence of that decision is that he doesn't really feel real or human. He doesn't have any meaningful flaws. I can maybe imagine someone waking up in the morning inspired to be like Mario, you know, happy, go lucky, action oriented, but I can't imagine anyone going to bed at night feeling like they fully lived up to Mario's standard. Luigi, meanwhile, is someone I can't imagine aspiring to be like, but who, if I felt like I lived up to their model as I lied in bed trying to sleep, I'd feel pretty good about myself. Mario is an aspirational version of each one of us, perpetually out of reach. Luigi is a genuine representation we can relate to, warts and all, because, well, we all have warts. Well, actually, I don't, but I do have an ugly skin tag I'm not going to show you. Wario, Mario's evil alternative, proves the point. While his character has slowly become more than his initial appearances, the character is unaspiring. He's greedy, gluttonous, miserly, vain, selfish, has poor hygiene. Wario is whatever the opposite of aspirational is, which makes Elon Musk's portrayal of him accidentally like spot on. When Nintendo wanted to make the opposite of Mario, the only viable direction was to invert his aspirational qualities, further proving that what makes Mario Mario is the fact that he's beyond us, a character on a pedestal we can only look up to but not attain. Luigi is a flawed version of Mario we can more easily relate to, so it's easy to see why his opposite, while Luigi is such an enigma. Luigi is complicated, as you recall from the contradictory litany of traits I listed just a moment ago. And it's a lot easier to invert a simple aspirational hero than a complicated and ill-defined one. While Luigi is a mass of contradictions, just watch Brian David Gilbert's unraveled video on the character. 
His complexity is the direct result of Luigi's own messy tapestry, which lacks an easy to invent villainous corollary. So instead we get Waluigi, who is famous primarily for being so damn weird. But enough about him. Luigi is an object of Mario's adventure as much as Princess Peach is. He is the one who doesn't get the girl until Nintendo mercifully invents a princess for him because they feel bad. He is the one who exists to reify the distinction of Mario as the center of the universe. When we see Luigi on the sidelines, only walking in his brother's footsteps when it's his turn, Mario becomes, concretely, not just a main character, but the main character. Luigi's purpose is to shift shape, serve in whatever necessary role to allow Mario to attain player one hood. If Mario is gaming's player one, then Luigi is player two personified. Ask yourself, who is player two? The younger brother waiting their turn to play Super Mario Bros. as Luigi. The parent playing Wii Tennis against their ecstatic 10-year-old because they know it will bring them joy. The woman who boots up League of Legends not because she loves the game, uh, who does, but because she wants to spend time with a buddy. The healer in World of Warcraft who sacrifices some of his own ambitions to keep everyone else alive and having fun. The party of 30-somethings having a Doom LAN party who stop all their death matches so that me, a six-year-old, could play through the first few missions of episode one with them cheering me on. The person who puts their summon sign down in Elden Ring to aid a fellow tarnished. The dungeon master who sacrifices being a player character so everyone else enjoys the campaign. Player 2 is all these people. Does Player 2 have fun? Of course. Is Player 2 important? Immensely. But do many people wake up in the morning and yearn to be the object of another's play? N no. Yet, in my 30 or so years on this earth, being Player 2 has almost always been more satisfying than being Player 1. While experientially, we are all the player one of our own lives. We are, in reality, more likely to be player two. If you know just two people and spend time with them, you are already player two twice as often as you are player one. If you play a game of Super Smash Bros with three other people, you are three other players player twos, and only one person's player one, that being yourself. But I'm not just talking about the total number of ways we can experience others and they can experience us. Most people in most circumstances are not the main character. The most important jobs even, teachers, nurses, construction workers, chefs, warehouse men, journalists, truck drivers, cashiers, janitors, librarians, electricians, mechanics, carpenters, the list goes on and on, simply support everyone else. I suppose you could say, we live in a society, and for that society to function, we've got to deny ourselves at least a bit, play our roles, be Luigi's. Let's look back at the games we played in season one of Elaborate Reviews. In Resident Evil Village, we're trying to save our daughter. She's the most important character in the narrative, not Ethan, which is proven in the game's epilogue. In Sekiro, Lord Kuro is the focal point of the plot, and we are but his humble servant. In Omori, while we are trapped in our own subconscious, it is our group of friends whose plight rings most true. The absolution of their pain resolves the narrative. In Advance Wars, we are pointedly not Andy, Sam, or Max, but a faceless military advisor helping them out. In Elden Ring, pretty much every ending, we simply serve the needs of another character, with a plan for the lands between. We do not imagine a new fate for this world, they do. We are just their tool. In Luigi's Mansion, as we noted in the first section of this review, what genuinely matters is not sucking up ghosts, but saving Mario. For him, Luigi will take on evil and overcome his fears. All of these characters are motivated not by personal vanity, an attempt to put themselves above others, but out of love, hoping to lift others up with their actions. None of these are chosen ones, right? And isn't that beautiful? Putting others above yourself, 
not being the center of attention, not putting the weight of the world on your shoulders, just doing your part. That's wonderful. And in a roundabout way, that's what Luigi's all about, which I rarely see anyone fantasize about, but it's more rewarding and realistic than imagining you could be Mario, Gordon Freeman, Sonic, or Master Chief. All characters who, sure, are trying to save the world, which is noble in its own way, but do so as the main character, as player one, with destiny on their side. Luigi, and by extension, player two's actions most likely lead to the world being saved all the same but they humbly allow another to take the spotlight because they know it's the actions that got them there, not the spotlight itself that truly matters. I have two interesting anecdotes to wrap this section up and this season. The first is a jump forward in time to Luigi's Mansion 3 and to Luigi's Mansion for the 3DS. Unlike the first two games in the series, these games do have multiplayer. How then might we rectify the issue? Who could be player two to the ultimate player two already? Well, how about Luigi himself? That's right, Nintendo probably understood they couldn't just give Luigi his own sidekick. Not after almost 40 years outside the limelight. It just wouldn't be right. Instead, player two assumes the role of Gooigi, a sticky and perhaps edible clone of the green plumber. While Guigi isn't a one-to-one -one copy of Luigi, he's as close to a simulacra as we can imagine before it starts getting really creepy. The existence of Guigi, just like how Luigi reaffirms Mario's player one status, confirms that Luigi is player two. No one else can be player two, and if somehow Luigi finds himself as player one, the only logical choice is to make a doppelganger of him out of goo. It should come as no surprise that the plot of every Luigi's Mansion game revolves around the capture of Mario. If Mario wasn't detained, Luigi wouldn't have to take up the role of hero, of main character. Really, the Luigi's Mansion games should be titled Mario is Missing because that's their central conceit, even more than a haunted mansion. Still, one moment in all three of these games stands out as particularly important for understanding who Luigi is the ending of the original Luigi's Mansion, which we've been elaborately revealing. After Luigi and Professor Egad turn King Boo back into a painting, there's only one thing left to do, free Mario. Reversing the process, we watch as Mario is sent through the machine, made to be distorted and twisted. Luigi waits with bated breath at the end of the machine for his brother to pop out. And after a moment of silent anticipation, Mario explodes out of the contraption, knocking over Luigi in the process. Mario sits in the middle of the lab, metal frame around his neck, dizzy and confused. Luigi looks over at him, and in an overwhelmingly emotional moment, begins to both laugh and cry and joy. The game's music comes to a satisfying conclusion, and the game gives the final spotlight to Mario before cutting to black. You heard that right. At the end of Luigi's Mansion, a game where Mario is trapped in a painting from the beginning of the game to the last 15 seconds of the final scene where Luigi overcomes his massive fear of ghosts and becomes a true player one for the first time in series history, where ghosts eventually learn to shudder when he walks down the hall. After all that, we end not on a close-up of our green man, but his brother. And yet, I can't help but feel like the ending scene telegraphs what Luigi's all about. He's the support, he's off screen, he's player two. When things are returned to their rightful order, he is simply overjoyed, crying, tears of happiness, and laughing his ass off in the background. Only audible to the player, because he knows now it's Mario's time to shine again. And his goal is simply to make sure that happens as player two. God, I love talking to y'all about video games. Isn't it amazing what depths of meaning they can provide? 
I loved this season of elaborate reviews about doppelgangers, and I hope you understand now why we had to end on Luigi's Mansion, a simply fascinating game about the most fascinating member of the Super Mario Brothers. A special thank you to my top patrons, Lily Noah, Maxtremus, Lysandra, and Begotta Destruction, and Christ is Lord, Alleluia, pass it on. If you enjoy these videos, I encourage you to join these lovely people and become a patron of the channel today. It's-a me, Luigi, I'm gonna suck you up.